In East Africa, Burundians will vote in a referendum set for May 17th that could extend President Kiyo Nkurunziza's rule for at least a decade, despite claims by opposition parties that citizens were intimidated to register. The small Central African nation has been unstable since 2015 when Nkurunziza decided to seek a third term in office that his opponent said was unconstitutional. During the week-long registration process last month, opposition figures and residents in many parts of Burundi said they were forced to sign up, with some reports that police set up roadblocks and stopped people to ask them for proof that they had registered. The government has denied the claims. The referendum will decide whether to amend the constitution to extend presidential terms to seven years from five. This could potentially extend Nkuruzinza's rule to 2034, a life presidency. Burundi has been rocked by insecurity since 2015, when the president decided to seek a third term in office that his opponents said was unconstitutional. Those who opposed Nkuruzinza's third five term launched an armed struggle against his government, and the resulting violence has left hundreds dead and forced at least 400,000 people into exile. Phineas Nigaba is a spokesperson for opposition party Fradebu Sahanwa. Changing the constitution without consulting is unconstitutional because Article 299 of the Constitution states that no revision can be made on the Constitution if it goes against national cohesion and against the principles of democracy. Okuruziza was elected president by lawmakers in 2005 after a peace deal ended a decade of civil war between the Tutsi-dominated army and Hutu rebels in which 300,000 people were killed. There is a ban on public partisan campaigning either for or against the changes until two weeks before the referendum. Nigaba says his party is rallying supporters to vote against the constitutional amendment. I want to take this opportunity to say to all our supporters and to all those who want to save and maintain the democratic process to support us in this process, but more importantly, to vote no. Human rights investigators and independent activists have accused government forces of widespread violations including forced disappearances and of orchestrating a campaign of terror. Regional efforts to find a peaceful resolution to the conflict have dragged on without results so far. The United Nations says five South African peacekeepers are facing paternity tests for the children of four women and a girl who say they were sexually exploited by them in eastern DR Congo between 2014 and 2016. UN spokesman Stéphane Dujuraik says four of the incidents concern exploitative relations with adults and the fifth concerned the sexual abuse of a minor. The new incidents highlighted took place in north and south Kivu provinces of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a UN peacekeeping presence has kept a variety of predatory militia groups at bay. The mission will continue to monitor their well-being and needs, as well as provide any additional assistance, such as the collection of DNA samples for paternity testing. We have informed the member states of this allegation, have requested that the national investigative officers be appointed between fi within five working days, and the investigations being completed with new reduced 90-day time frame due to the serious concern raised by the new allegations. We've also requested that the investigation be jointly conducted with a team from OIOS, but our request for joint investigation was previously rejected by the South African government for the last set of allegations. So we, we do expect that that may be the case here as well. We're, of course, gravely concerned about the allegations, which come only a month after three reports of sexual exploitation involving the South African military contingent were received by the UN mission in the DRC, Allegations against this contention continue to occur despite our sustained efforts to partner with member states and to prevent and address sexual exploitation and abuse, as well as other forms of misconduct. The mission and its partners on the ground encourage anyone who becomes aware of such behavior to report so that it can take action. We put the victim's rights and dignity first and are committed to ending impunity for all sexual acts. 
UN spokesman Stéphane Dujaric. Meanwhile, the guns may have fallen silent in the Congolese town of Mwene D2, but each day starving children arrive at the small hospital there battling for their lives. Fighting between the army and the Kemia Inu Nasupu militia went on for about a year in the generally peaceful region's worst outbreak of violence in decades. As many as 5,000 people were killed and an estimated 1.5 million others were forced from their homes. The deployment of more government troops into the Kasai region has largely put a stop to the violence and hundreds of thousands of civilians are now returning home. But as they do, hunger and disease are eclipsing guns and machetes as the region's most prolific killers. The United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, says about 400,000 children in Kasai suffer from severe acute malnutrition, roughly the same number as in civil war ravaged Yemen. UNICEF spokesman Krista Bulirak says only 13% receive medical attention because there is not enough financing or attention. What we are saying is not that children are at risk of dying, it's that they are dying in the Kasai. We have visited the hospitals, we see in the villages, and thousands of children have died because of this malnutrition, which is acutely severe. There is not enough attention given to this situation, which is an abnormal situation, which kills children, causes great suffering, and is also jeopardizing the future of this region and the future of the country. While a cholera epidemic that has already killed more than 100 people also rages, the fields that grow the cassava and maize, the population dependent to survive, lie barren for months of neglect. La plupart des malades que nous recevons, the majority of the sick we receive come from villages where there's been fighting with Kamwina and Sapo, and they are women, mothers who suffered in the bush for three to four months before arriving here. When they get here, they first go through the nutritional outpatient unit where they do the triage and then send the cases of acute, severe malnutrition to the intensive therapeutic nutritional unit. The crisis in Kasai is one of several gripping the Democratic Republic of Congo, where President Joseph Kabila's refusal to step down when his mandate expired in December 2016 inflamed a combustible mix of ethnic grievances and competition over land and mineral resources that has fueled years of conflict. In all, the United Nations says over 13 million Congolese need humanitarian aid, twice as many as last year, and 7.7 .7 million face severe food insecurity, that's up to 30% from a year ago. Meanwhile, aid groups say they have only a fraction of the $1.7 billion they need this year, so many of those returning home hungry and destitute find that they are left to fend for themselves. As over the last three months. And that's Network Africa at this time. Many thanks for watching. I'm Millicent Walker.